Dorothy Brunson is starting her fifth year in Baltimore, and she's quite proud of WEBB and its contribution to the community. She tries to program to the mass population, which is the seventh largest black population in the United States, by giving you gospel in the morning and adult contemporary in the afternoon. But there is more, much more, that Dorothy wants for Baltimore blacks. A greater awareness of self. I think that uh, I would like to be responsible for bringing to the black community more culture, more um, e uh, expansion of, of more history about what the black contributions are. We have, for instance, no major museum in this area, unlike other large cities with large populations. We have a very small arts community. We, we have just arena players, for instance. It would be wonderful to be able to have two or three theater events going on, movies which uh, address the black community, and and uh, there's an overall lack of, of uh, culture, and I think I would like to be able to contribute to that. One of the functions that Dorothy and her staff take pride in is the cultural affair held at the Winchester Armory. The bringing together of crafts, craftsmen and women, artisans, poets, lecturers from major institutions, the Smithsonian, uh, the Black Wings exhibit, Association of African American Museums from the African Museum in Washington, to say, here's something, here's a, a fantastic culture, and, and enjoy it. Has Dorothy seen many changes? Well, not too much. Uh, I think that our, our culture is kind of starving in this city. Um, Why? We, well, I don't know if it's because we have not had uh, a lack of, a, a sense of participation, a coming together, if you will, of culture. I think it's kind of a segmented community in that respect. But Dorothy is always looking ahead, trying to give the best she can and get the most out of fellow black Baltimoreans. Making Baltimore sound good. W E B. It wasn't so long ago that yellow ribbons became a national symbol as we waited for the hostages to come home. For these students at Coppin State College, green ribbons stand for the slain children in Atlanta, children who couldn't come home. We would like for the people to wear green ribbons until the case has been solved. They had a concern for the black children that were killed down in Atlanta. I'm wearing my ribbon for those the kids in Atlanta because I feel much empathy in my heart for them because I am black and I can imagine how it would feel if I were to send my child to school one day and he wouldn't return home. I think it's, it's really sad. The person who's doing it, no one knows. I just hope they will find him soon and very soon. So when you see people wearing a ribbon like this, you know they're showing their support for children in Atlanta and hoping the case will be solved soon. This is Mary Norton on the scene at Coppin State. You were stopped at a stop sign as a truck approached the intersection. You saw exactly what happened? Yeah. What happened? Well, two guys, they were chasing the truck, running after the truck. And one of the guys slipped coming off the pavement. And the one that got killed ran between the truck and the car. And he fell. And the truck ran over his head and killed him. At a morning news conference called in the basement of the Social Service Building in Baltimore, welfare rights head Bob Cheeks had his organization prepare lunch for Social Service Director George Musgrove. On the menu, oatmeal, green beans, navy beans, string beans, apple sauce, and cornbread. Meat is not included in the typical meal here because the program is currently over budgeted. You'd like John Clark? Is there a change that can be made in the quality of food? Being served? As I've explained, we're already expended 50% over our budget for food in this year. I am trying to find every penny I can just to supply this food for the remainder of the year. Um, I admit that it is tasteless. Um, I've been told that it is nutritious, even though it is tasteless, and I can understand why children would not eat it. Uh, 
Well, but I have no solution as to where to find the money to supply either the seasonings or the meats or any of the other things that would make this a tasty meal. Uh, I'll, I'll try the oatmeal. That's the worst one. <laughs> the apple sauce ain't bad. I can't. I can't see myself swallowing. <laughs> but this is what we have to force on our children to eat, just to keep so keep fill up the space in their stomach. And I really don't. I don't think it's funny. More than 26,000 poor Baltimoreans have eaten this kind of meal on a regular basis. The city says Reagan budget cuts is one of the many reasons why funding cannot be increased right now. But Cheek says he knows where to find the money. Take some of that money from the mayor's pet projects, such as the Lyric Theater and the, and the aquarium and, and some of the other craziness that we have here in Baltimore City, and put that money. We don't care whether it comes from the city, state, or federal. So I will obviously make an appeal that more monies be allocated to this program so that we can improve the food. What's the possibility of that being a reality? Uh, it is a budget year we were told to hold the line and to expect cuts. Uh, I hope that I will be able to get an exception in this case. I think this is a, a, a very a uh, dramatic example of the fact that people do need uh, decent food in order to live and a very dramatic example of how hard times are. Musgrove says he needs at least $65,000 from the mayor and city council to improve the quality of emergency food. Sheik says if the money can't be found, Baltimore may see a long hot summer. I'm Art Norman on the scene at the Social Service Department headquarters in Baltimore. A near-capacity crowd packed the Calvert Hall Assembly program this morning as the theme of Brotherhood Through Understanding was echoed by the Dunbar Chamber singers and its director, Hugh Carey. choirs that eventually ended the program with a traditional we shall, we shall overcome was through the years the way blacks prayed in song when social injustice became apparent Tonight, department heads from eight city and state agencies faced a large crowd in West Baltimore, but it was not a face-off. These agency heads were called in by this area's elected officials to try and do some problem solving. This is a community with an unemployment rate of almost 50 percent, a critical shortage of housing, one of the highest crime rates in the city, and tonight these citizens had plenty of questions for the public officials who were here. Is it so that they go by the scores, you know, what, what type of score, what type of score you obtain? Rubber, you'll be chosen for a job, or is it a buddy buddy system? For youth 18 to 25 in this area, the unemployment rate is 57 percent. So it was no surprise one of the biggest concerns here tonight was jobs. While Maryland Secretary of Personnel Theodore Thornton had mostly news of state job cutbacks, he did offer personal help to those at this meeting who are looking for work. You who have a job, do the best you can to keep them. Those of you who don't have a job and are interested in talking further about it, if I can't handle all your questions, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock for the first 40. That's all I can accommodate. If you're in the second 40, I'll schedule you to come back another time. This is the largest turnout on record for a town meeting here at the Upton Center, and there is no doubt in anybody's mind about the reason why. I think that it's a larger crowd because of the, the cuts. I think that people are beginning to feel pressure and they're beginning to understand exactly what's going on. Those who came here tonight accomplished at least one thing. They have made some direct contacts with people from City Hall and from the State House, contacts who will hopefully help them find some answers. Joyce Jefferson, Channel 2 News Scene, the Upton Multipurpose Center. 
When you see one of those spectacular displays of fruits and vegetables at the Lexington Market or your local supermarket, do you wonder how all that produce gets there? Well, it all comes through a local wholesale market in Jessup that most of us never see because it opens at 3 in the morning. But it's important in determining what you eat and what you pay for it, and it's the subject of today's cover story. When the market opens, trucks from corner fruit stands and chain stores are lined up waiting to get in. They pay a $2 fee to enter, then come in and shop the several dealers who sell here. Three oranges. Where were they, 88s? The atmosphere can be chaotic, with the motorized forklift driver, the king of the road, and prices subject to negotiation. How much is apples here? They seem to carry everything, stocking anything someone might buy, and it comes literally from around the world. Seasons limit the variety only slightly. They'll fly in anything that might sell. They are strictly wholesale, and they don't cater to the guy who wants half a pound of this or half a dozen of that. Don't break any packages. Otherwise, we'll sell you a bushel of beans or a bag of potatoes, but nothing less than that. Perhaps the best way to see how they operate is to take a Lexington Market merchant like Tony Serio and follow him around as he makes his purchases. Give me a box of these here. That's it. We'll take a couple. Let me have a box of limes. How about white yams? White yams? No. All clean out. Tony is already a second-generation fruit dealer, and the torch is being passed to a third generation, his son Sammy, who's also learning to buy. Give me three boxes of 135s. Tony and Sammy have to deal with some pretty sharp wholesalers. They have to know sometimes not to buy. Can you use them? No. Extra large? No, I don't use olives. You don't use olives? No. I've got to get rid of them. I need, a, I need a home for them. And they have to buy only what they need. They are competing with other buyers who don't mind getting up early. The earlier you come, the better the bargains. And they compete now with a new threat to their businesses, the householder who has formed a co-op with others and comes to Jessup to buy wholesale what she used to buy retail from Tony. First of all, the produce is fresh, and we know that uh, we're getting select produce, and uh, we figure we're saving about 50% buying this way. This way means no fancy packages and trucking at home yourself. It means making your kitchen the distribution point for all your neighbors to come and get their share. And it means bookkeeping headaches. But it brings two bags full of produce for just $8 a family, which this Columbia co-op distributes every two weeks. But if it seems tough for the buyers to get there at 3 a.m., consider the dealers, who must start a lot earlier than that. I want to get here about midnight. And, uh, we open up, take orders, set them up, answer the telephone, make our calls. You know, make the displays, unload the trucks. And all the while, he has to undercut the prices of his competitors. He has to have a wider selection and a better display and higher quality. It appears they do a pretty good job since they attract buyers like Scott McNeil, who could much more conveniently go to Philadelphia, but prefers Jessup. Oh, the prices are better, the service is better, the uh, market's cleaner. All that's great, and perhaps you think you'd like to come shop here. Well, there's one word of warning. You told me that uh, since I'm not one of their regular customers and I wouldn't be a big buyer, I'd probably pay a little more for things here than you do? That's right. If uh, you come in and want to buy one or two, chances are dealers are going to charge a little bit more. So maybe it's as well to let the pros go to Jessup, to let them wrestle with the bushels and crates and problems, and let them make it look nice and let them risk the spoilage. At least now we know where they're coming from. I'm Andrew Barth, Channel 2 News Scene, Jessup.